All right, good morning, everybody. It's 10 a.m. It's Monday morning. This is Bernanski's vlog. We're gonna give it a second to wait for that green light showing that we have a strong connection to YouTube. And it looks like we've got it. All right, great. So we'll go ahead and get this introduction rolling here, and then we will be right back to talk movie news, movie reviews, and a little bit more. So stay tuned for this week's brand new episode. <laughs> We are back. Good morning, everybody. This is Jeremy Bernanski. You're watching Bernanski's vlog right here on YouTube. It's 10 a.m. PST. It is Monday morning. Hope you guys had a great weekend. Hope you're able to get out to the theater to see some of these movies we're going to talk about. Let's go ahead and get into that right now. But before we do, let's get into a few couple commercials. So really quick, if you're new to the channel, thank you so much for stopping by. Hope you enjoy today's brand new live episode. If you have not yet, click subscribe. Go ahead and do that. And then also hit the bell so you get the notifications once new content drops. Because you are going to want to stay tuned to this channel because we also throughout the week drop movie reviews. And sometimes we do DVD and VOD reviews. So you're not going to want to miss any of those. So click the subscribe button. Hit the bell for the notifications. And then also be sure to follow us on Twitter at Bernanski's Vlog because we do updates throughout the week there. And finally, Stardust, the Stardust app. You can download that from the App Store. That is where we do all of the movie trailer reviews. So if you're watching trailers online, if you go to the movies and you're watching these trailers before the films, if you've ever thought, I wonder what Jeremy thinks about that, head over to Stardust, Bernanski's vlog, because that's where I do all of my movie trailer reviews. Got over 100 up right now, lots of content. Check it out. I will be doing some more tomorrow. So stay tuned for those on the Stardust app. So we are going to go ahead and move now into this week's news segment. We're also going to talk about the weekend box office. I was able to get out to see two different films this weekend, Hotel Artemis and Ocean's 8. You'll hear those reviews a little bit later in the show. But let's go ahead and take a look at the weekend box office, kind of see what everybody else was checking out this weekend. And then we'll move into some news stories. So let's go ahead and cut to the news right now. All right, so down below, you can see that we have the ticker tape is running. So all of the honorable mentions are going to be right there for you. Honorable mentions just, is it a news story that was interesting? Probably. Do I really want to dive deep into it? Probably not. And that's why it's in the honorable mentions. So go ahead and keep your eyes on the ticker tape as it's going through. And you can check out all the honorable mentions as they roll right by. All right, let's go ahead and take a look now at the weekend box office. As I said, I got out to see Hotel Artemis and Ocean's 8. Those reviews are going to be dropping later in this show. But let's find out what you guys were checking out in theaters this weekend. Again, we go from number five to number one. So here we go. Coming in at number five. Avengers Infinity War at $6,836,000. Hereditary, $13,037,336. Deadpool 2, $13,650,000. Solo, a Star Wars story at $15,154,000. And Ocean's 8 coming in with a dynamic $41,500,000. So... Wow, job well done to Ocean's 8, job well done to Marvel as well for having Avengers Infinity War here in its seventh week, still in the top five. Pretty impressive stuff. Uh, as far as Hereditary goes, this came out from A24. They've been doing some smaller budget films, but they do them really well. So really happy to see that A24 is still doing a good job with these films that they're putting out. Hereditary horror movie, right? If you're a watcher of this show, if you're a faithful viewer, if you're the type of person who has clicked subscribe, you know horror is really not my bag. It's just not. And I'll still celebrate movies that come out that do really well and make the top five, because that means you guys as fans are going out and supporting what you love, supporting what you enjoy. So that's awesome. So congratulations to everybody who got out to the theater to see Hereditary and supported their genre and their style of film that they like and their stories. 
Not for me, but I'm not going to poo-poo on your guys' parade. You guys did a great job getting out to the theater to check out your film. So job well done. Deadpool 2, still enjoyable. My review for Deadpool 2, my review for Avengers Infinity War, and my review for Solo is a Star Wars Story, all on this channel. Just go to the movie review playlist. Those are waiting for you there. So you can check out my thoughts on those. But just real quick, Deadpool 2, I had a lot of fun. There were some story issues I had with it, but overall, I really enjoyed it. Solo, a Star Wars story. Same thing. I enjoyed Solo, a Star Wars story. I was most impressed with the final product because of how much trouble, how much turmoil was going on behind the scenes to make this movie and what we got for a final product, I thought was really good. So I enjoyed it. I thought, you know, Ron Howard did a really good job piecing this thing back together and doing a last minute reshoots on pretty much the whole film uh, from what we know from different articles and stuff like that. So you know, I enjoyed it. Go see it if you haven't. Don't believe the hype. Don't let people poo-poo on your parade. If you like Star Wars, if you like adventure, if you like Han Solo, check this film out on a big screen, the biggest screen you have, because it looks really good on the big screen. Ocean's 8, I enjoyed Ocean's 8. As a fan of the franchise, this is the fifth Ocean's film, right? Because we had the original one back in the 60s with Sinatra and the Rat Pack. Then 2001, jumping way, way ahead in time. 2001, we got George Clooney and Brad Pitt bringing together all the guys for a, a reboot of the oceans films Di same character names but you know different everything everything else very different um so check that out if you haven't seen those i recommend it because those films oceans uh oceans 8 or oceans 11 oceans 12 and oceans 13 all tie into oceans 8 there we go so you're going to want to check out those three before you don't have to necessarily but if you do you'll enjoy oceans 8 a little bit more because of some of the nods and references that go back to the film for us as fans. Um, I enjoyed Oceans 8, though, as you'll hear a little bit later in the show. So job well done to the top five. Again, Avengers Infinity War, Hereditary, Deadpool 2, Solo, A Star Wars Story, and Oceans 8. Just real quick in the top 10, Life of the Party, Upgrade, Hotel Artemis, Book Club, and Adrift. So for my thoughts on Hotel Artemis, stay tuned because that's going to be dropping later in the show. And Upgrade and Life of the Party, my review for both of those films are in the movie review playlist right now on this channel. So you can check those out. Spoiler alert, I enjoyed both of them for different reasons. So that wraps up this week's box office breakdown report. Um, nothing really jumps out to me at all, even in the top 10, like just moving from the top five to the top 10. Um, nothing really is like, wow, I can't believe it's doing that great. Avengers Infinity War, I believe, is... Closing in on the one or the $2 billion mark. So it's going to be in the $2 billion club pretty soon. But I think we kind of all expected that because, you know, 10 years, an incredible film, uh, a villain that really is three dimensional with depth. And there's just a good backstory on his character. So not really surprising that Avengers Infinity War is doing that well. Um, Adrift, uh, as we've talked about before, it looks like it's going to be a good human piece about relationships. I still haven't seen it yet. I, I would like to get out to the theaters, but as you'll hear later in the show, there's a lot of films dropping this week as well. So competition's getting tough as we are well into the summer season here. So let's go ahead and move into the first story of today's news cycle here. And this is coming to us from Hollywood Reporter. And this is, oh, and just real quick, if you want to, since I forgot to mention this earlier, if you want to go ahead and click the little arrow and expand the description box because all of the links for all of these articles are down there in the description box. So you're gonna wanna check those out. All right, so here we go. Suicide Squad gets new writers. David Bar Katz and Todd Stashwick are penning the script with director Gavin O'Connor. So that's great, right? Because that means Suicide Squad 2 is still on track. I know a lot of people didn't like Suicide Squad. Me personally, I didn't really have a problem with Suicide Squad. I had a problem with the ending of Suicide Squad. I thought everything leading up to the Amanda Waller rescue was really good. And then it just kind of takes a jump into like late 90s, early 2000s CGI weirdo monster fest, right? Like it goes off the rails completely in a very odd way. But like everything up to that point, I really, really enjoyed. So with this new with this new movie coming out, there's hope for me that after having kind of seen what happens when you go off the rails, it gives them an opportunity to kind of regroup, come back together, focus on an actual story that these villains, because they're just basically humans for the most part, baseball bats, guns, you know, arrows, whatever, like just humans uh, can actually like go up against a formidable threat that's realistic, right? Because they still need all of these people to come together to stop one giant threat. But 
let's make the threat realistic for these villains. Uh, so when we look at these writers that they brought on, I put them up on IMDb. Not a whole lot as far as their writing credits go. So that kind of gives me a little bit of pause because I was like, oh, good. We're still getting a Suicide Squad 2 movie and we got new writers. And then I looked at them like, but we don't really know what these writers are capable of. And when you have a franchise like we have with the DCEU or the DC films or whatever you want to call it online, they really haven't had a, a big, consistent like streak of wins. They had Wonder Woman, which was awesome. Uh, and we're going to talk about Gal Gadot in a little bit in the show. But we had Wonder Woman, which was awesome. Right. So that's one out the gate. Man of Steel, I enjoyed over time. Initially, I was like, that's different. And then after I sat around and marinated on the story, I was like, well, it kind of makes sense. He's been Superman for like a day. He doesn't really know what's going on. And then all of a sudden there's a threat. So we're getting a different Superman than we've ever had. And we're also getting a different Superman than we've ever seen. So I enjoyed Man of Steel in the long run. Initially, I was a little taken back by it. But the other films that have come out really haven't been a grand slam. So you've got one that's really celebrated, right, with Wonder Woman. And then you've got Man of Steel, which is a little controversial as far as fans are considered. And then Justice League, Batman versus Superman, Suicide Squad. These films just didn't really deliver across the board like I think a lot of us were hoping they would. So when you've got a franchise that's only really had one big hit, it would be nice to see people being brought in that can instill some confidence in us as viewers going, oh, yeah, this writing team is super good because they've done films, A, B, C, D, E, whatever. Right. But when we're bringing in writers that we don't really know what they're truly capable of and what are we resting our faith on as far as this franchise goes and as far as the extended universe goes. So I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Um, the next story is kind of tying into this let me know what you think about a suicide squad 2 movie because the next one is coming to us from empire and this is in regards to jared leto getting his own joker film so we've already got the joaquin phoenix joker film right with todd phillips now we're also getting um a jared leto joker film that's going to kind of branch off from the suicide squad movie so again we're coming back to this concept of what is happening with the dc films so if you're going to do your own separate Joker movie. If the Joker's not going to be the main villain of the Suicide Squad 2, that's okay. Tie it all together, right? This is just me spitballing here, but you had Lex Luthor at the end of Justice League with Deathstroke. He escaped prison, right? We know that Deathstroke's working for him currently. Um, so why not have the Suicide Squad try and recapture Lex Luthor, but Lex Luthor hires Deathstroke as kind of like a bodyguard assassin to help stop whatever's going on with Suicide Squad and trying to capture him. Just ideas to throw around to try and kind of tie everything together from what we already have. I don't know, throw your thoughts down in the comment section below, but it's getting a little confusing. When you announce you got a Batman movie coming out with the Penguin and possibly Deathstroke, well, possibly the Penguin, possibly Deathstroke, and then you've got Suicide Squad 2, but there's no real talk about that film, and then you got two Joker films being released at the same time. And then we've got Wonder Woman 2 getting ready to come out as well. And everything is kind of starting with that. And we're seeing logos and everything else and getting an idea of what that story is going to look like. We got this year, we've got Aquaman coming out. We still really haven't seen any footage from that. So there's just this weird vibe with the DC universe, the DC films that I'm looking forward to seeing kind of what happens and what shakes out because I'm hoping they can pull it together and really start delivering uh, Wonder Woman quality films consistently because I think we would all agree as fans of films and fans of these characters in the DC universe that would be pretty great right to actually have a consistent delivery of stories and characters and films that are all enjoyable so I don't know we'll have to wait and see obviously the, the uh, Joaquin Phoenix Joker movie is just kind of separate it's not tied to the DC universe but it's still I think it'll get a little confusing for the the casual movie goer uh, folks like my parents or my family or anybody else that, you know, or friends like way outside of like entertainment and stuff like that, that just periodically like turn on the TV and they see commercials and they're like, oh, this is looks different. And they're like, oh, wait, is this a different Joker movie? What's going on? I think it might lend itself to some confusion to the casual movie goer. So we'll have to wait and see, but hopefully they can pull things together. Let's go ahead and move on to the next story. Quentin Tarantino has been busy with casting for his next film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. 
And this is coming to us from Deadline. So Al Pacino has joined the cast. Al Pacino is going to be joining with, up with the likes of Brad Pitt, Leonardo DiCaprio, Burt Reynolds, Elle Fanning, Dakota Fanning, Tim Roth, Kurt Russell, Michael Madsen, Luke Perry, and Damian Lewis. Wow. This cast is something spectacular. Now, it sounds like, because there was some concern, is this going to be a Charles Manson movie? Like, where you see, like, all of the terribleness and everything that went on with that whole thing back in that time period. And it's starting to sound like that's not going to be the story. That's just going to kind of be in the background. So it's going to kind of like be this thing that just kind of hovers over the film, which I think is smart because I don't think many people want to go and revisit that tragedy. But if you can take talking points from that to use as part of your marketing strategy to help bolster uh, fan interest and viewer interest. I think that's pretty smart. So when you take a film and in here in the article, it says the movie sounds like the movie sounds like it's not going to be about the Manson stuff, but it takes place during the height of hippie Hollywood and centers around Rick Dalton, who's played by Leonardo DiCaprio, former star of a Western TV series and his longtime stunt double Cliff Booth, who's Brad Pitt. Both are struggling to make it in Hollywood. They don't recognize anymore. Rick has a very famous next door neighbor, Sharon Tate, and Pacino is going to play the agent of Leonardo DiCaprio's character in the film. So it sounds like this is going to be a movie about movies being made. So pretty meta. But we're going to have these characters that we know from the Manson story also injected into that. So again, the movie's not really what it sounds like, right? It's not going to be about the Manson murders or anything like that. It sounds like it's going to be about like life in Hollywood at this time with these characters that we know from something terrible that actually happened in real life. So... I think that's probably the better way to go. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what Tarantino can do with this film. Uh, Tarantino is one of those directors where I may not like sit down and be like, wow, that was a great film. Like the Kill Bills, I'm like, meh. But like other films that he does, he has a, a specific visual style and storytelling style that I enjoy. Same thing that you get with Guillermo del Toro and with uh, Tim Burton's and stuff like that, where, you know, when you go into their films, you're getting their type of film, their vision, their dialogue, their visual styles, their storytelling like how they shoot it, what camera angles they're using and stuff like that, their close-ups, everything else. Like, you know, it's very specific. It's artsy almost. So I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do with this film. And I'm happy to hear, like, just from that little synopsis that it's going to be kind of revolving around a movie being made in a movie or a TV show character is being made into a movie and them trying to figure out what this new Hollywood is that they're part of. And then, like, behind that, kind of like just this ghost hanging over the whole thing is like these terrible tragedies that happened in real life. So again, gives it talking points. So when people say, Oh yeah, this is the film about that. That's not really true, but that's an element in the film. So I'm looking forward to seeing what comes from this film. All right. Let me know what you think. Are you a fan of Tarantino films in the comments? All right, moving on here to the last news story for movies of the day here. This just dropped this morning, right before the show. Uh, this is coming to us from the wrap. Gal Gadot is joining Dwayne Johnson's Red Notice. So Dwayne The Rock Johnson just doing big things, right? Every movie he puts out is doing really well. He's Right now, he's a big action star, uh, which is pretty awesome because his movies are enjoyable and he's a really hard worker. Same thing with Gal Gadot. Big fan of hers and just her delivery and her performance in her films I've enjoyed. And I think she's really starting to come into her own as an actress, which is great to see. So... Really excited to see that she is coming on for Red Notice. Now, if you aren't familiar with Red Notice, we talked about this movie a while back in previous episodes. I think probably season one of the show, of this show. Um, it's basically about Interpol. They send these notices out, these red notices, right, about these people that have committed crimes that need to be extracted from countries to stand trial. So Red Notice is the group that goes out for Interpol to pick these people up. So it's like international bounty hunters is kind of what it sounds like in a very kind of cool way so you got the rock you've got wonder woman i don't see how this doesn't hit i'm looking forward to seeing more from this i think it sounds really good uh it's got that kind of mission impossible feel where it kind of seems to me that they're going to be jumping all over europe or all over other countries we don't know it's interpol but it could be really cool gal gadot she's great action she knows how to do action right because of her training and everything like that so Really looking forward to seeing her come to life in the story. The same thing with The Rock. Obviously, The Rock has got a lot of training and combat and stuff like that. So he knows how to throw down, as we've seen before in movies and action movies before. I think this could be a really big hit. Looking forward to more from this film. So 
Let's go ahead now and move into the next segment of the show. And that's going to be movie reviews. Again, at the top of the show, I told you I got to see Hotel Artemis and I got to see Oceans 8. So we are going to roll to those movie reviews right now. And then right after that, don't go anywhere because we're going to be right back here. We're going to talk what's hitting theaters this week, what's arriving on DVD and Blu-ray this week, certified rad. And then I'm going to give you my thoughts on the new Dave Matthews Band album just really quick, as well as IHOP has some interesting news. And we'll just talk about that real quick right before we sign off. So stay tuned. we got movie reviews coming right now. Again, Hotel Artemis and Oceans 8. And we'll be right back with you. It's Los Angeles, it's the future. The riots have started, downtown businesses are closing up shop as the mob moves through the streets. However, one hotel has left the light on. And no, this is not a cheesy bad commercial for Motel 6, but it could be if they wanted to pay me. This is about the Hotel Artemis, a members only exclusive hotel where criminals go to get emergency care. So does Hotel Artemis live up to the excitement and action promised in the trailers? Or should we simply find another hotel on Trivago? Let's talk about it in this review. The story takes place primarily within the walls of the Hotel Artemis. Now within these walls, we meet the head nurse, the nurse, played by Jodie Foster, and her assistant and also head of security, Everest, played by Dave Bautista. And these two are on call 24 hours a day in case any of their members need emergency care. They can stitch you up, create new organs, create parts to existing organs that were damaged. Whatever you need to get you back on your feet, out on the street, to continue your life of crime. They have a set of rules that they abide by at the hotel, similar to the Hotel The Continental in the John Wick series, that these rules must never be broken. Well, in this story, a few of those rules are broken and we're off and running. And all this film really surprised me. I walked out of the theater initially really happy with my time I spent in the world getting to know these characters and the rules in the hotel. And after I had some time to marinate on the story, it kind of hit me that this story feels more structured similar to something like a one act play than an actual three story arc. It primarily takes place in one location at one very specific time with one very particular moment in each of these characters' lives. The backstory that we get on all these characters is minimal, but that is due to the level of secrecy that is part of the rules for the Hotel Artemis. And it's moments like this that happen over and over again throughout the film. We get some information, but not a lot, and that's just somehow kind of okay with us as an audience because they do like a quick write-in to make it just part of the general aesthetic of the story and in this world because of the secrecy and the rules of the hotel. And that's not necessarily a total negative because they do enough and they give us enough information to where this film could spin off into other sequels, and in those sequels, they could actually better develop the story and the mythos. And this feeling I had didn't really pop up until the very last scene of the movie where my opinion went from, oh, this is pretty awesome, to, oh, well, now I kind of want more information. It's when the nurse tells Waikiki, played by Sterling K. Brown, that there's another hotel, just like the Artemis, in Las Vegas. It was in that particular moment that my entire opinion adjusted. Within the movie, we're told that the Wolf King, played by Jeff Goldblum, helped create the Hotel Artemis with the nurse. And within the movie, we also find out why. And we also find out and discover throughout the movie that the Wolf King pretty much owns all of the criminal underworld in Los Angeles. So if the Hotel Artemis isn't really just a unique thing that happens and exists only in that city, and there's another one in Vegas, does that mean there's like some kind of secret underworld leadership cabal that exists where they create these hotels all over the planet? that are just these members only exclusive emergency rooms for criminals, we don't really know because they don't really explain it. But we do know that they exist. And so just like the John Wick franchise with the Continental, they could have really explored more of the hotel and the mythos of the hotel. Instead, what they chose to explore was the relationship between the Wolf King and the nurse. And I'm not going to go ahead and spoil that relationship in this review. And keeping with giving us enough information, but not a lot, that's definitely what they do with their relationship. We get enough information about their backstory, but not a whole lot, because again, it feels just like a quick write-in to kind of fill out the story to what is basically just a very thin story that fails to meet its full potential. The runtime for this film is approximately 93 minutes, and in all honesty, this film could have gone longer to explore the characters, the hotel, and everything else. Now, faithful viewers of the show have heard me criticize other films for just being too long, wasting screen time, not moving through scenes, this is not that type of film. In fact, it's the opposite. 
They could have definitely spent more time with these characters in the hotel, building out the world, everything else, and I would have been happier. Hotel Artemis is playing at your local movie theater right now, and I am actually going to recommend a big screen viewing of this film. Again, I really enjoyed the characters, I really enjoyed the hotel. Each villain in this movie had a different skill set which made them feel unique to the story, and each one kind of helped drive the narrative forward and move the story along. Plus, Sofia Boutella is absolutely gorgeous in this movie and incredibly lethal, definitely adding her to the list of femme fatales that we've seen in the last year. The Hotel Artemis has this boutique hotel feel mixed with modern technology, secret hallways and passageways, etc. It was all done really well. Again, I just wanted more from this story and more exploring of the characters and everything else. I also really enjoyed how by the end of the film we see that this particular movie was a great launching point into what could be an even larger franchise with other hotels or just sticking with the Hotel Artemis and continuing to explore that criminal underworld that happens in the hotel. And because of that, Hotel Artemis is getting at least one high five from this guy. Hotel Artemis is playing at your local movie theater right now. Check it out. The fifth film of this franchise takes a step in a familiar direction with fresh new characters. The job is simple. Steal diamonds off the neck of a celebrity at a gala that has private security watching everyone's every move. And then live to tell the tale. So, does Ocean's 8 deliver on the fun, stylized heist stories that we've come to expect from this franchise? Or should we leave these stories to the men folk? Let's talk about it in this review. As a fan of the previous four films, I was looking forward to seeing a new heist and meeting new characters. Even though these are new characters on a new heist, I still appreciated how the story is connected to the more modern George Clooney, Brad Pitt led Oceans series circa 2001. The relationship as brother and sister between Danny and Debbie Ocean, Debbie played by Sandra Bullock, was a nice touch to kind of show connective tissue in this world. I also really appreciated the two cameos that popped into this film, one at the beginning, one at the end to really just kind of shape out how these two worlds are connected. And I'm not gonna spoil anything because the second cameo is actually pretty important to the story. And if you're a fan of the franchise, you'll really enjoy it. I also really enjoyed how this film had the same stylized look and approach and music and that jazzy funk sound that the other films in the franchise have. With those camera shots that you see way back and then all of a sudden they zoom in and they change the focus mid zoom. Also how they had the split screen transitions. All of these little things that just kind of tie it all together to really just establish itself in the Oceans franchise. Really liked it. The outfits, the sunglasses, the characters' personalities, they all just fit and blended so well and really established that they are part of the Oceans world. The overall story, while I enjoyed it, it didn't really wow me the way that I hoped it would. All the things I just mentioned and joined, including why the tiny submarine was necessary and how that fits into the plot, these little moments all hold up but personally I feel like they didn't really have the magic that they were hoping to deliver. In all honesty, Sandra Bullock and Kate Blanchett did fine jobs in their roles, but to me it felt like the director Gary Ross just looked at them and said, okay, just be George Clooney and Brad Pitt's character, but female. The rest of the cast though, they felt unique, they felt special. They didn't feel like rehashed versions of characters we already know from the other films. The other ladies were clearly directed to act like brand new characters, so that Paired with the flat delivery that we got from Kate Blanchett and Sandra Bullock, again, who I believe were told to act that particular way, made the overall story feel a bit disjointed for me personally. The premise of the story still works despite some character issues I described because the actual story is more than just stealing diamonds. There's some pretty solid layers put into this story that shows the writers really paid attention and wanted to create a believable world, which did help up my enjoyment factor of this film. The writing stayed true to creating a problem solving it, adding a fresh, unique new problem to the mix, figuring out how to work around this new problem and then solving that, then achieving the goal and also accomplishing one or two more things. And again, I won't spoil those one or two more things that get accomplished because the ending of the movie does have a nice fun twist and surprise to it. Ocean's 8 is playing at your local movie theater right now. And I am going to recommend a big screen viewing of this film if you enjoy heist movies, the Ocean's franchise, or any of the leading ladies in this movie. It's definitely a fun time that I think you'll enjoy. This isn't the worst film of the franchise, but it's also not the best. The story and the characters, for the most part, are unique and fun. As we expect, the music in this is jazz funk deliciousness. 
and the familiar tropes we've come to expect from these films continues to be fun to see on the big screen. And because of that, Ocean's 8 is getting at least one high five from this guy. Ocean's 8 is playing at your local movie theater right now. Check it out. All right, and we are back. There is my thoughts on Hotel Artemis and Ocean's 8. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for sticking around. We are going to finish up this week's show. But before we do that, <clears throat> we're going to take a quick look at what's arriving in theaters this week, what's arriving on DVD and Blu-ray this week, certified rad, and then we'll give my quick thoughts before we sign off about the new thing that IHOP's doing and the new Dave Matthews Band album. So let's go ahead and take a look at what's hitting theaters this week. And we've got John Travolta is Gotti. That's right, the Teflon Don. Then we have Incredibles 2, Tag, and Superfly. So out of these films, uh, the ones I'm most excited to see are The Incredibles 2 and Tag. I'm looking forward to seeing Gotti because I think John Travolta is really going to bring the sauce with that film. Looking forward to that. Superfly looks good as a remake, uh, but we'll have to wait and see again with a drift out. <coughs> Excuse me. With a drift out, Gotti coming out, Incredibles 2 coming out, Tag and Superfly. There is a lot of films still in theaters uh, and will be in theaters this weekend that I want to see. Plus, if in my area I can get How to Talk to Girls at Parties as well as uh, American Animals. That's a lot of films to try and see. And with Movie Pass, I can see one a day. But still, that's, you know, six, seven movies. So we'll have to wait and see kind of what happens there. But looking forward to Incredibles 2, looking forward to Tag, looking forward to Gotti and Superfly and Adrift and How to Talk to Girls at Parties and American Animals. So there you go. Let's move now into DVD and Blu-ray. We've got Strangers Pray at Night, Love, Simon, Sherlock Gnomes, I Can Only Imagine, and Tomb Raider. Out of all of these films, I saw two of them or Nope, I only saw one of these films. I saw Tomb Raider. So you can check out my review for Tomb Raider on the channel in the movie review playlist. Uh, I Can Only Imagine did really well at the box office. That, again, is a faith-based film uh, about the song I Can Only Imagine. And the journey the story, uh, the journey the songwriter went on to tell that story. Sherlock Gnomes missed that one, but that's Johnny Depp. And then also we've got Elton John doing the soundtrack for that. Love, Simon did really well in theaters. Uh, that is a young adult comedy uh, coming of age tale. And then Strangers Pray at Night, uh, sticking with the Strangers horror franchise. Uh, that got some decent reception, I, if I recall, from folks in that world who liked the Strangers franchise and those types of movies. So there you go. That is what's arriving on DVD. Again, if you want my review, full review for Tomb Raider, you just go to the movie review playlist and you can check that out right there. It's waiting for you. All right, this week, you guys never know what's going to drop, but I can guarantee whatever drops will most definitely be Certified Rad. This is my favorite section of the show. So this week, if you saw in the title for this week's episode, Bugs Being Turned Into Chips, that's right, actual insects being turned into like tortilla chips that you can dip in salsa or guacamole or whatever. And this is coming to us from the Good News Network and you can find again in the description box below. What happened is it's tortilla chips made from insects and the company is called Chirps Chips. Chirps, like chirp, chirp. Chirps Chips. And what happened is uh, this was picked up by Mark Cuban as part of a shark tank. And in the article, it talks about uh, this college student named Rose, who, while on a trip to China, she was dared to eat a fried scorpion. And she did. And she said it was actually pretty good. It tasted like shrimp. And then she thought, why aren't people uh, all around the world uh, eating more bugs? So she had figured out with her college roommate, Laura, uh, Laura they began experimenting with crickets um, to try and figure out how they could actually turn crickets into something people would eat. Again, this is all in the article, so you're going to want to check that out. And what they did is they figured out that if they can kind of grind up the crickets and if they can turn it into a high-protein tortilla chip, gluten-free, obviously, uh, but it's this high-protein chip that's now being sold in stores and stuff like that. So when you step outside of the box, when you go out on an adventure and you really try new things and you experience the world from a different point of view, and then you come back with this fresh perspective and you're able to figure out. And again, in the article, it talks about all the different reasons she thinks this is a good idea. And I kind of have to agree with her for the most part. Um, 
<clears throat> but when you can step outside of the box and like see the world and see kind of what you see are issues in the world and you find a solution to try and create change to fix what you see are issues and are problems, you can guarantee that that is certified rad. So congratulations to Rose and her roommate, Laura, on creating Chirps Chips. Um, again, uh, after being backed by Mark Cuban for winning on Shark Tank. So that is pretty cool. So check that article out. Again, it goes through all the reasons uh, that she kind of came up with this and kind of what inspired her to see an opportunity for change and then to act on that and actually create change uh, for issues that she's passionate about. So really cool story there. All right, so just real quick, the new Dave Matthews Band album dropped. Um, a lifelong fan of Dave Matthews Band, even his solo stuff, I've really enjoyed. So I was really excited when I heard he's got this new studio album. The album drops, listen to it a couple of times all the way through, and then I've just kind of like picked back and forth and jumped between songs. The album's pretty good. If, if you're a fan of the franchise, or if you fr franchise, if you're a fan of his musical style and his band style, I don't think you're going to be disappointed with this album, but I don't think you're going to be wowed either. It's uh, it, it's just a it's a groovy melodic album that just showcases kind of where they are right now in their musical career. There's nothing really like exciting about it, but there, again, there's nothing like there's no eye rolls. It's just like okay, this is a good album, uh, which was surprising. There's no no real like groovy like upbeat tunes that really catch up like what we got with Stay right from before these crowded streets or uh, ants marching or anything like that. There's nothing really of note that like really jumps out as like a big pop tune for the radio. It's just kind of okay stuff. There was one tune on there. It, I can't remember the name of it because it's not actually a title. It's like D C D D D B D C K K or something. I don't know. It's just a series of letters that started up and I was like, this is dope. This is fire. And it's just going. And I was like, okay. And then it just ends. And what it turned out to be was like it was an interlude to another song. And I was like, ah, oh, bummer. They finally got a banger. And then all of a sudden it was just like womp womp. So check the album out. Just be prepared for as soon as you start to groove and move your head. Because you're like, yes, this is legit. That moment's going to end very briefly, very quickly. And then it'll be back to the more melodic grooves that the rest of the album kind of deals with. So there is my review for the New Dave Matthews Band album. All right. USA Today just dropped the story about how I hop is becoming IHOB. That's right. Instead of a P for pancakes, they are going with a B for burgers, which I was like, oh, okay, cool. They're just going to kind of call themselves IHOB. They're not really going to do like signage changes or anything like that. I guess they are. But what I didn't realize is it's only going to be temporary in the article from USA Today. Uh, it says the change is not permanent, a company spokeswoman said, but rather is a move to promote its new burger line. So that's kind of curious because I was like, oh, cool. They're going to focus on burgers. Sure. Why not make some burgers? What are you going to do with all of the 13 different syrups that are on the table at IHOP? I don't know, because like the only person I've seen put syrup on anything that's not pancakes is Will Ferrell and Elf, right? When he puts it on the spaghetti. So I don't really see people like pouring a lot of syrup over their burgers. So it's kind of curious to see, like, they're going to go to the International House of Burgers, kind of see what that takes up. Um, but if it's just temporary, I don't know why they're doing such a big change as far as everything else is concerned. But we'll have to wait and see. I haven't been to IHOP in forever, so I was like, IHOP's changing? So I guess they are. I guess they're going to focus on burgers. And if you're a burger person, you may want to go check out the International House of Burgers, now being referred to as IHOB. All right, and that wraps up this week's episode. Thank you guys so much for joining me here for a brand new episode, season three, episode 11, coming to a close right now. Again, if you have not clicked subscribe, go ahead and click that subscribe button and then hit the bell so you get the notifications once new content drops on this channel. Also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Stardust at Bernanski's Vlog. Again, Stardust is where I do all the movie trailer reviews uh, right there on Bernanski's Vlog. Over 100 up right now. Go check it out. Click the subscribe or follow button. And we will see you guys next Monday right here on YouTube with a brand new episode of Bernanski's Vlog. Hope you guys have a great week. Hope you're able to get out to the theaters to see some of these films that we've talked about today because there is a lot in theaters right now. And there's even more, as you just heard, coming out this weekend. So check it out. I'm Jeremy Bernanski. This is Bernanski's Vlog on YouTube. I'm getting out of here because I've got other stuff to do. We will see you next Monday right here on YouTube at 10 a.m. PST. And until then, good night and good luck.